Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! Okay, let me preface this story by stating the fact that I am well aware that it sounds absolutely insane. I also don't really condone the behavior displayed therein, including my own. My family is a dumpster fire that gives trailer trash a bad name and unfortunately every word herein is true to the best of my recollection because it's happened about 25 years or so ago. My grandmother started having children young. She married at 13 and had my father when she was 14. So she wasn't quite as old as other grandmothers by the time I was born. She had full custody of me from the day I was born. I never went home from the hospital with my parents, which meant that grandma was the only mother I ever had. My father and mother didn't want to raise me because they were too busy getting high to care about their baby, so they just gave me to her and bounced, which is why she had me to start with. It did not end well for me, but that's a topic for a whole other Reddit group. My grandmother has been dead 10 years now, and I still have nightmares about her, so that is a fair indication of the type of person she was. She was vicious and had a timber like a powder keg. One tiny spark and it was on like Donkey Kong 100% of the time. She was also super possessive of me to a degree that she was a little terrifying. It bordered on obsession and it was not healthy. However, it meant that when something happened to me, she had no chill. At all. Ever. She could go from zero to psycho in about 0.3 seconds and it was at times a little inspiring when it wasn't directed at me. Though since she was abusing me herself, but apparently in her mind she was the only person allowed to treat me like this, there was a particularly aggressive bully that lived near my house. He hated me, I hated him, and it was a consistently escalating problem. I was almost never allowed to go outside as a child, so when he bullied me it was always at school, and the staff turned a blind eye to it more often than not. Well, one day I came home from school, 5th grade by the way, with a fat lip and the giant bruise on my face. My bully had managed to catch me between classes and had taken the opportunity to beat me where nobody could see or report him for doing it. My grandmother snapped. She took me by the hand and we walked to the bully's house and I stood in the driveway watching her knock on a door. I was petrified at the time because I knew the mood she was in and I was also scared of the bully and his mom. I was a giant bowl of vaguely human-shaped anxiety, and for good reason. Bully's mom opened her door and looked at my grandmother, and the conversation went essentially as follows. It's been a long time since I can't entirely remember everything that was said. What? Serious disrespect in both tone and delivery. Your son put his hands on my little girl. And? The witch didn't even try to deny it. She just lit herself a cigarette and blew the smoke in my grandma's face, daring her to do something. Now, grandma wasn't a big lady. She was average sized and about 5 foot 5 tall, so not particularly intimidating physically. The bully's mom was a larger woman, about grandma's height but much heavier, outweighing grandma by at least 60 pounds. So she was not impressed with grandma showing up at her door and she didn't care about her son's behavior or grandma's feelings about it. This was a mistake, because about a half second after the bully's mom blew that smoke in grandma's face, because grandma didn't give her a single sound of warning before she snatched the bully's mom up by her hair, dragging her out of her own house with it and onto her front porch, and then promptly threw her off it face first. Following her down into the yard was murder in her eyes, it was a trailer porch, so it was actually a pretty decent drop too, because her trailer was set up higher than normal. For my part, I was absolutely certain that the bully's mom was going to die at the time. As I said, grandma had issues, you know. And that meant that when she snapped, she snapped. And when that happened, she was capable of almost anything. The bully's mom took the fall like a trooper though, and came up swinging. She managed to clip grandma's cheek, before grandma managed to get a good hold on her hair again and use it to fling her on the ground again. Grandma hit her a few more times before she managed to pull grandma down with her. The two of them were rolling around in the dirt like a pair of angry dogs. 
snarling and swearing and biting and clawing at each other. It got ugly, so very ugly. The bully's mom was a tough cookie though. I'll give her that. She was given as good as she got for a hot minute, but she wasn't ready for what grandma was capable of. They wrestled on the ground for a while, but grandma finally got the bully's mom on her back and started feeding her knuckle. They wrestled on the ground for a while, but grandma finally got the bully's mom on her back and started feeding her knuckle sandwich as her knuckle sandwich while sitting on her chest. Then the bully's mom made a terrible mistake. See, she tried to use one of her legs to hook my grandmother and either flip her off or kick her in the face. I am not sure which it was really, but the end result was that her bare foot was way too close to grandma's mouse. Grandma's response was to turn her head and bite one of the bully's mom's toes clean off at the joint and spit it right back into her face. I will never forget the look on the bully's mom's face when it's happened. It was a combination of incredulity, horror and what just happened rapidly followed by pain because she started howling like a scaly cat and the whole time my grandmother was still screwing her up. Only now the bully's mom wasn't trying to fight, she was just trying to get away because she finally realized that grandma was crazy and absolutely capable of killing her with a smile on her face and a song in her heart. This was the point that the cops showed up and separated the two of them and they had to pry grandma's hands from around the bully's mom's throat to do it. The bully's mom was out cold by that point and purple, so one officer put my grandmother in the squad car with me beside her while the other called an ambulance for the bully's mom and looked for her toe. Then came the explanations and most people would have been screwed by that point. They really would, but grandma was without question the best actress that I have ever seen. If she'd used that skill in movies or theaters, she would have been an Oscar winner without a doubt. It was extraordinary. She could rewrite whole events and even if you knew that she was lying, she'd end up having you believe in her version and questioning your own memory insanity. To this day, I have no clue how she did it. The story she spun for the cops was one of her greatest works of fiction. And this was how it went. Grandma claimed that I had come home from school after having been assaulted by the bully and that she'd wanted to speak with the bully's mom about his behavior and try to work out something to correct the problem between our families in a responsible way. But when she knocked and the bully's mom answered, the bully's mom was hostile from the beginning and eventually became physically aggressive when my grandmother said that either she dealt with her son or grandma would be informing the authorities immediately. Then came the big performance and what a performance it was. Uh, tears started to trickle down grandma's face and she used her most quavery old lady voice to say that she and I had turned to go. But that the bully's mom pushed me out of the porch. And after I hit the ground she tried to do the same with grandma. But that grandma had grabbed her out of reflex as she went down. They ended up falling together with grandma on top. Grandma claimed that the bruise that I had on my face came from the fall not the previous altercation, and that once they were on the ground, grandma had just lost it. And could the officer really blame her? The woman had just assaulted her and her child, and she was only one old lady. She was so scared that if the bully's mom got up, she'd hurt me or her, and grandma wouldn't be able to stop her again because it was only luck that put her on top when they fell. All the while, she cried quietly, not big sobs, nothing showy, just silent tears sliding down her face and that tiny quavery old woman's voice. She apologized for her actions because she was just so scared. Then the officer looked at me and said, Is that what happened? It was a very scary moment for me and while I'd like to say that I told the truth and that I did the right thing, I was honest with the officer about what had happened, I can't because that would be a lie. I absolutely did not do any of those things. Instead, I looked at grandma and let the fear and the stress of the situation just rise up and swallow me. And then I used that emotion to promptly burst into tears myself. I didn't really talk, just nodded my head and cried and clung to grandma, who stroked my hair and rocked me back and forth while I was trying my best not to look the officer in the eyes. I knew I was nowhere near a good enough flyer to pull it off if he was looking dead at me. So I hid my face against grandma's shirt and just did my best to seem traumatized. And he bought it. Hook, line, and sinker. 
The police mom ended up being arrested for abuse of a child, assault, disturbing the peace, and possession of an illegal substance. Because when they searched her, they found a small bag of weed in her clothes. This all occurred in the mid-90s, so weed possession was no joke at the time and had heavy penalties. The police mom also ended up being responsible for my grandmother's hospital bill for the sprained wrist she ended up with from pounding on the bully's mom's face like a meat bongo. But so never got reattached and the bully's mom ultimately ended up losing her job and going to actual jail for four months. It was on probation for like three years after. My grandmother didn't catch a single charge from that day's events and the bully's mom's family eventually moved from the trailer park and I never saw any of them again afterwards. Moral of the story? Never screw with old trailer trash ladies. You might lose a toe. Two disclaimers. One, no one died. Two, I am not the subject of the story. Rather, someone else is. So, I'm a race car driver. Well, getting back into it after a horrible accident a few years ago. But that's besides the point. And I race mostly vintage stock cars. I.e. Oldsmobile AMC Hearst. We're talking late 60s, early 80s. Now, for those who know a bit about these cars, their moment of inertia along the roll axis in reference to the pitch yaw roll concept is incredibly small. So they flip easily if they spin and they really like to flip rapidly. So there is one kid, I think late teens, who is fairly rich. It wasn't that he was a bad kid, but he certainly didn't shy away from getting physical. Granted, this is local track stuff, so beating and banging is expected. But this guy will shove you into the wall and you better believe getting your alignment screwed up and not being able to steer because someone wanted to pull a slight job on you will leave a sour taste. One night a few years ago, we were geared up for a 3 8 mile dirt track. Speeds typically range from 50 miles per hour. On corner Abex, the slowest part of the turn and 110 miles per hour on the braking zones. Well, at the beginning, I'm sure the speed tapers off further along in a run as tires wear out. I am behind sick kid and another driver who is notorious for being a hothead. Again, he wasn't a bad dude either, but he was a fight on Sunday, beer on Monday kind of guy. He didn't hold on to things, but he gets pissed easily. I don't really remember how far into the event we were, but I was trailing these two for a few laps. The kid was trailing right behind Hot's head and presumably tapping on his bumpers a bit. This is typical short track racing. It took a while, but the kid finally got the inside corner panel of Hot's head and was able to stick his car into the inside. And essentially ran side by side with Hot's head for a few laps. They were bumping doors a bit. The kid was trying to take momentum off of Hot's head and pull away, but he could never really clear him. Hot's head had a Real good weight balance from what I can remember, when racing with him in other events, is so difficult to move around and pass. Eventually, the kid gets tired of being door to door, so coming out of one of the turns, he very flagrantly slams Hot's head into the wall. Which, while not necessarily illegal in this league, it's definitely a big no-no among drivers unless you're looking to fight. And here is the revenge. I don't think the Hot Head's car was damaged too terribly much. But he had to be steaming. The yellow flag was flown and as the field was slowing down, I remember him zooming right past me to catch up with the kid and give him a solid smack in his bumper before getting to the outside panel and spinning him out. As I mentioned earlier, these things are easy to flip over and flip quickly once they are sideways. So of course, the kid starts going into a supercharged barrel roll. The car kept flipping and flipping until finally the roof of the car hit the catch fence, but not just any part of the fencing. You see, small tracks use advertisements on steel beams right behind the catch fence to help earn some revenue to keep the place going, mostly in the corners so audience view isn't obstructed. Well, when the kid hit the fence roof first, he hit the solid steel beam behind it as well, completely crushing the survivor cell of the car where he was sitting. I'm not one to be super pessimistic, especially in a race, but being right up close to when it happened, I knew the kid was in trouble. I could see the lights just out of the corner of my eyes of the track safety workers running out to help him. 
And when they red flagged us, all I could see was out of my tiny little mirror just sticking out of the window. The workers were going into overdrive mode and trying to extract him out of the car, which usually means the driver is in critical, life-threatening condition. So, the aftermath, the kid ended up being in critical condition with a compressed neck, broken jaw, and nearly severed tongue. I assume from his teeth going right into it and biting down on impact. Concussion, severe internal bleeding, spinal contusion, and the herniated disc. This was all described in the local paper the next day. I don't think I ever saw him race again, nor do I really know what he's up to now. I did feel a bit bad for him as a person considering the amount of injury, but as a driver I couldn't as much. As if I were that upset, I'd probably spin him out too. I don't think Hothead had intended for him to be as injured as he did, by the way. As for Hothead, he was black flagged and parked for the race and from the track for about a year, I think. From what I can remember, he was not charged with anything. However, he was fined by the track and by the kid's family. Understandably so. Again, as a person, I shook my head at him for what happened. But as a driver, I know I would have done the same if I were that angry. And like I said, you can never really predict the consequences of what happens. There is a lesson for all of this and this is important for those who want to get into racing. This isn't a sport where your body is in total control and you can lay waste to your opponent if you want. These are incredibly fast 4 silent pound machines that can and will hurt, injure or even kill others if you're not careful. The best way to avoid situations like these is to keep a very calm and collected head, which trust me, it's going to be pretty hard. And to maintain a level of mutual respect as not just a competitor, but as someone who is so easily at risk of getting a life-changing injury from one person's decision. This happened years ago when I was young and didn't know labor laws. I was working for a tour company as a guide. I was a new hire and it was winter-only work. They required a cash deposit from their staff as a training fee. Turns out lots of staff that arrive in tourist towns underestimate how physical this job is I would rather recover from hangovers and go to work. So they said. And the company owners felt they had been screwed over too many times in the past and now required a cash deposit before anybody started work. I think it was $500. Not a small chunk of change. I was just moving house so I had to also pay a rental deposit and deposits for phone, electricity and natural gas. Heat. Since I'd never had these things in my name before. So I asked my new employer if they could take the deposit in 2-3 to three payments half of my paycheck. They wouldn't. I somehow scraped together the money. I liked this job, but it was very physical and took some time getting used to. I was fit and healthy but developed tendonitis in my wrists. I mentioned my sore wrists once in front of my boss and she suggested I go to the doctor for it. At first, I declined. Didn't think it was a big deal, but it was getting worse, not better. So I went later that week. Of course, the doctor sends me out with some forms because it's a work-related injury. And this is where everything went downhill. My new bosses think I'm out to screw them because now there will be a claim and their insurance will go up. Despite the fact that they told me to go to the doctor in the first place. Everything I do to try and make things better is looked at through a lens of suspicion. And I'm confronted multiple times per day to explain my motives about everything I do. I can't even look in the direction of the office computer without being accused of something. I start feeling nauseated even thinking of going to work. They also let me know that I am being demoted. As my injury, they claim, will never heal well enough to allow me to guide. My doctor did not agree. But that didn't matter to them. I am lamenting all this to my boyfriend who happens to know the labor laws here pretty well. And he schooled me. That cash deposit is a condition of employment illegal. They were also only paying us once we arrived at the staging area. And not the 30 minutes of work we all did at the house prepping everything before and after. They were only paying the driver when we drove the 30 minutes to the staging area. They said the passengers were on break, which is not how breaks work. The nice lady at the labor board helped me draft a letter that got my deposit back and my co-workers' deposits. And my co-workers paid legally for their time. I'd already quit, but did get back pay. 
Normally, I am a pretty sensitive person and hate conflict, but when I stopped by to drop off my uniform, she was acting so ridiculously over-the-top angry, like a toddler timber tantrum, that I couldn't take her seriously. It was all I could do not. All I could bring myself to do was not laugh in her face. I even got an angry letter from her a couple of weeks later telling me how they changed all their policies because of me and that she hopes I am happy. I sure was, and the job was a much better job with much better pay that I didn't have to go to the labor board to get. Maybe their staff turnover wouldn't be so high if they just treat their employees like human beings. This is my first story on Reddit. Might be a long one as well. Hope you like it and hope it belongs here. Entitled Ant will be caring for the story. Everything started several years ago around 2013-2014 in Mexico. My entitled aunt has a history of harassing my grandma, her mom, with money loans, stealing her food, and even making grandma pay for caring utilities bill. My aunt harasses my grandma saying it was her responsibility to make her daughter happy or that she was in a need wouldn't her mother help her. To the point of pressuring my grandma into asking the bank for a loan. No one knew anything. My 65-year-old grandma had to start to work selling anything she could to pay the loan. In Mexico, there are some products by catalog called Avon, Stanhome, Andrea Shoes that you can offer and sell. Grandma starts selling them. I mention this for you to understand what she starts selling. To the point that she got sick due to stress. Her excuse to my mom is that she did it to make her feel young. Grandma, being a farmer all her life, we could understand she could not be sitting all day doing nothing. Since mom paid for her rent, food and utilities bill, my mom let her be but always warned her to do not overpressure herself. The time passed, it was now 2016 and she started accumulating late fees for not paying the loan on time. One day, my mom receives a call from my grandma's neighbor because grandma passed out due to stress. She rushed to her house to find her house empty. We thought that someone had stolen everything, but no. The loan fees were too high and the payment was overdue for over one year. And the bank had taken everything from her house to pay the loan. And here is when we knew that entitled aunt harassed grandma into the loan. My mom was furious. She and my stepdad paid the loan and recovered grandma's stuff. It was around 7k in debt was a bank that my mom and stepdad ended up paying for grandma. It was around $7,000 in debt was a bank that my mom and stepdad ended up paying for grandma. From there and on, my mom hired the nurse and had my two younger sisters to go with grandma after school every day to take care of her. Mom worked in a different state and she only came on the weekends and that is why she asked my two sisters to take care of grandma. Also, they did not move due to stepdad job and grandma. Both were in high school at the time and always had someone at home to avoid Karen coming to her house to steal goods or to harass grandma. 2016 passed. I finished university in 2015, so I was able to start working. I was able to get hired by an USA company and save some money. In 2018, mom and I decided to purchase a house for grandma. We did all the paperwork and purchased a house for her. By the way, if you wonder why grandma was paying rent and had no house, it's because alcoholic grandpa lost their farm gambling. We knew that entitled and would try to trick grandma into giving it to Karen. This is why the house was in my name. Everything was great for the next few years, then 2020 came, the worst year overall. And we feared the worst, you know, COVID, and the inevitable happens. Grandma passed away. We are glad to say that she had a peaceful death. She died in her sleep, happy and well taken care of from my mom, sisters and her nurse. We knew that Karen would try to make her move, so I asked my sisters to take her personal belongings from the house to trick Karen. They agreed, took any furniture out, clothes, anything from the house, even a small nail, at the front door to hang some plants, and they left the house empty. Three to four weeks after this, my sister saw a big sign that say, for sale, with Karen's phone number on it. I knew the time to start the revenge was close. I asked my family to let her be and that I had something in mind. Two months after the sign, the house was sold, and my sister saw people moving in. I felt bad for these people, but I had something in mind for them as well. 
Six months passed after the new people moved into the house and then it was time to act. You may wonder why I took six months to act. Well, my aunt has a history of wasting money. I waited for her to waste most of the money from the house that she illegally sold. Revenge time. This is for you, grandma. Event 1. Before COVID, my wife and I had planned to go visit my mom for her to meet her granddaughter. So we continued with the plan. We took our precautions traveling and we went to Mexico to visit my mom. Event 2. My stepdad was into politics his whole life. I asked him as a favor to search the best lawyer he knew for this and we got the best. I presented my case to him and gave him the original house scriptures. He said it was going to be an easy win. Event 3. Like I did not know anything, I went to grandma's house with my key copy and opened the house. This was part of the plan, even though there were already people living there. I acted surprised when I saw people inside the house and asked why they were in my house. The gentleman in the house stated that he had purchased the house. I showed him the house scriptures and he was shocked. He then mentioned that the paperwork was being completed and gave the phone number of the agent. I apologized for coming into the house and went to the real estate office. Event 4 Arriving to the real estate office, I asked for the agent in charge of grandma's house being sold. When he looked at me, it was like he saw his last hope. My assumption was that he thought I was going to agree to the house being sold. Our conversation was something like this. Hi, are you Mr. Agent selling the house in X address? Yes, nice to meet you. We were trying to get a hold of you. What for? We had a small issue with the paperwork and we only need your signature and the house will be sold. This might be a mistake. I'm here to talk about the house being sold because I did not agree to sell anything. Saying this to him was like a cool bucket of water was poured on him. The glow in his eyes was gone and he knew he screwed up bad. Really bad. Why is this change of mind? We've been talking via phone and you agreed to everything. You even mentioned to come as soon as you arrive in town. You've been scammed, my friend. I have never talked to you before. Then I suggested calling me from the phone number we have been talking to. He did and someone answered. Surprise, surprise, it wasn't me. Then I just mentioned that I wanted my house back, since I have never agreed to anything, or I will legally proceed to sue them. And I walked away. From this point, I knew everything was going to go down for Karen. Three days passed and I encountered Karen at the Walmart parking lot. I politely approached her to say hi like I did not know anything but when saying goodbye, I then asked why she sold my house. She started to get nervous and deny everything until I mentioned that our lawyer is suing her. A way to say we have a strong lawyer on our side. She then tried to defend herself that grandma gave her the house and she had a paper with grandma's signature. I just smiled and mentioned that grandma did not have the power of doing that since the house was in my name and she better get her crap together because a storm was on her way. One week passed and we did not hear anything from the agent, so I paid him a visit again. It was hard to track him down, I tried to contact him for two weeks with no luck, so we proceeded to sue them. As soon as the suit was placed, I received a call from the agent to meet him. I refused and hung up. I did this to make everything harder for him by avoiding me for two weeks. He then found out who my stepdad was and found his office address. He had the audacity to visit him too, my stepdad being a busy man. He ignored him and said to contact me and that he should have listened the first time. After three days of constant calls, my wife being sick of the calls made me answer and I agreed to meet. In the meeting, he gave me his version of the story and why the house was sold. He mentioned that Karen contacted them for a house to be sold Karen stated it was her mom's, grandma's house, and she inherited it. She then presented the paper with grandma's signature, who was a fake class 12, stating the house belonged to my grandma and Karen was a new owner after grandma passes away. This was nonsense, of course. Then, when the agent started the paperwork, he found out the house was in my name. He contacted Karen and she assured him, I agree, and gave him a fake phone number. This could be Karen's boyfriend or someone on her side. Not sure, as of today, who it was. The agent was in contact with this fake me for a long time waiting for the paperwork. And then he mentioned that I was supposed to visit him to sign the paperwork. This is why he was so happy when I arrived the first time. The agent begged to stop any legal action since he could go to jail. 
I agreed if he agreed to the following terms. A. Recover my house, make the people inside my house move out. B. Get a new house for the people currently in my house with the money they have already spent. He agreed to term A, but for term B, he was not sure. I then stated that it was his fault for approving the paperwork without my signature and that he will need to recover the money from and to pay for the new home for the people currently in my house. They will need to solve this. I gave him two weeks to solve this or else I would sue them all. Event 5. Notify Karen about the fraud she had committed and she better has the money to return it. She did not take it very well. As always, she acted like she was on a right, saying grandma gave me this and no one can take it from me. We will see. Event 6. I went to talk to the people in my house to give them a heads up of the issue and apologize for the misunderstanding since it was never their fault. Explain that they will be moved soon to a new house and not to worry. The RSA will take care of everything. Event 7. We got a call from the agent at the end of week 2. After we talked, he mentioned that my house was empty and that the people in there was in a new home as well. I called a gentleman that was in my house and he confirmed that they were in a new house and everything was good with the RSA. Also, my house was empty. Event 8. Karen, time to pay which. Since the agent and I were on good terms now, we started working together to sue Karen for fraud and identity theft. We went hard on her as we sent a letter to court notice and on the date she did not arrive. We sent a second letter and this time she did arrive. While in court she never talked, at least not as an adult would. She was all the time crying and sobbing that we tricked her, that the house was hers but all this was hard to understand was her desperate crying. We present our evidence, we even brought the bank records when she harassed grandma into getting a bank loan and we brought witnesses. We had the whole circus set and ready for a big show. A cool lawyer was smooth talking and presenting everything, stating the house was in my name and that Karen has a history of tricking grandma. At the end, we won the case. Karen had no evidence other than a fake class 12 from grandma, which was written by Karen and only had grandma's signature. Not only that, no lawyer was informed of this to back her up. The sentence. Karen was to give all the money she got from the house around $20,000. It was half of the house price since the paperwork was not completed. And she had two weeks for this, then nine years in prison for fraud and identity theft. Guys, I was so happy for this when the judge gave the sentences. Karen was speechless. She couldn't even say a word. She even stopped crying. Her world and life had just collapsed in front of her eyes. From that time on, I had not spoken with Karen or anyone about this, besides mom, sisters, and stepdad. This was on November of last year, 2020. Did not know if Karen was able to pay everything back, but did know that when the cops went to her house to arrest her, she tried to escape and was on a run for two days, until she was caught riding a bus to Veracruz to escape, or at least attempting to escape. This isn't quite my revenge story, but I did play a part in it. It's also going to be a long one. So I was in Girl Scouts for almost 10 years and from September 2005 to October 2006, I had this awful Girl Scout leader who clearly didn't like me very much. I didn't fit her. Everyone in my troop needs to have a type A personality mentality. And she did a lot of really awful stuff to me. She knew I was terrified of dogs. I was attacked by two dogs in a public park as a young child. And I was highly allergic and didn't inform me that a search and rescue dog would be visiting our troop. Then used me as a target for a demonstration causing me to nearly pass out due to the combination of the panic and the allergy attacks I had. The handler refused to sign the paperwork for the badge activity and instead of picking another activity to do to complete the badge, the leader decided we would earn the badge and blamed me. She cancelled the community cookie sale I was scheduled to run with another girl and her mother because I had to duck camp at the last minute because I got sick and she blamed me. She put me in charge of a magazine subscription fundraiser. I told her I wouldn't be able to run because of academic commitments. It inevitably failed and she not only blamed me but kicked me out of her troop. I joined another troop and a leader turned her desire for a scapegoat to another two girls of my troop. 
one of whom I went to school with. This will be important later. Now in April of 2007, that troop took a Girl Scout sponsored and funded trip to London during school vacation week that the council in our area put a significant amount of money into. And I feel like I need to explain because it is relevant to the story. Girl Scouts is very strict when it comes to lodging accommodations for overnight trips, camping or otherwise. Under no circumstances may girls stay in the same room or building for camping trips as an adult male. I was in a troop where one of our assistant leaders was a troop member's father. When we went on weekend camping trips, he had to sleep in a tent outside the lodge we stayed in and when the troop went to Savannah, Georgia, he wasn't allowed to stay in that same room as his own daughter. Well, this awful troop leader decided to save some money by staying in co-ed adult hostels while in London, but told the Girl Scout Council that they would be staying in hotels. None of the girls or parents of the girls were remotely okay with this decision, but the leader basically told them, I am the leader, we do what I say, and if anyone says anything, I'll make sure you get kicked out of the organization. I don't exactly know what happened on a trip because, well, I had already been kicked out of that troop, but from what I heard from the girl I went to school with, their lodging accommodations were terrifying and most of the girls found themselves too scared to sleep. One night, a guy was strutting around the hostel in his birthday suit and would make clue comments to the girls, who were between the ages of 12 and 15. One night, one of the girls woke up to another guy just staring at her while she slept and the leader didn't see anything wrong with it. She just brushed it off saying, well, that will sometimes happen when you stay at hostels. The two girls and everyone else on the troop wanted to get back at her, but all of them were intimidated by her. So I casually mentioned to my school friend that my troop leader was on the Girl Scout Council, and if she and other girls were willing to visit my troop for a meeting, we could potentially work something out. The other girl said that she would provide the pictures she had secretly taken in the hostels. The girls were warned not to take pictures in the hostels, but they didn't want to be involved in any further than that. My school friend was moving to another state during summer break, decided she had nothing to lose, and came to my troop meeting with her laptop and a flash drive with a copy of the pictures on it from the other girl. My leader was appalled and immediately asked if she could borrow the flash drive so she could present it at the end of the year council meeting. She also promised she would keep our identities a secret. Again, I don't quite know what happened at that council meeting since it was held during school hours, but from what my leader told me, all hell broke loose and here is the aftermath. The awful leader was immediately kicked out of the organization and given a lifetime ban. She was tripped to the multiple awards she had earned as an adult. She was forced to pay the $2,000 that council had awarded to her for the trip on top of the $10,000 plus fine she was handed. Girl Scouts takes the safety of their members very seriously. She was nearly charged for child endangerment. None of the parents of the girls involved wanted to go that far. I still see that leader at the market I work at from time to time and usually says hi and asks how things are going without knowing that I had a hand in getting her banned from Girl Scouts.